Hi, everyone. I am Daphne Pillay, the president of the International Women's Federation of Commerce and Industry, India National Chapter. On behalf of IWFCI India, we welcome our viewers to the second virtual fireside chat on the topic global business environment, the new normal, a topic widely discussed in the business world today. After the tremendous success of our first virtual fireside chat, which was meant to help entrepreneurs rebuild their businesses, take on new challenges and discuss new entrepreneurship opportunities, we were besieged with requests to have more of these fireside chats with successful business entrepreneurs showing us the way. And as we embarked on the journey to identify a topic for the event, we decided to continue the discussion about the business environment in the post COVID-19 era and how we will deal with the new normal. Whether it is in financial planning, technology, marketing, e-commerce, supply chain, media or lifestyles, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all sectors in all parts of the globe. With our globalized economy, we would be hard pressed to find any country that has not been affected. Entrepreneurs and enterprises around the world are feeling its effects and are expecting to deal with its aftermath for a long, long time. The business environment has changed dramatically. Companies have to rethink their business models, reassess their managerial thinking, and rebalance their priorities. With this in mind, IWFCI feels that it is imperative to help prepare the community for the management of the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis that has crippled industry, investment, and economy. Additionally, this global issue may be handled differently in different countries to address different cultures and economic factors. The situation has triggered intellectuals, economists, business leaders, and civil society to debate on this current and crucial issue, the initial stages of recovery and the roadmap ahead. Today, by sharing experiences, information and challenges, we can make this seemingly insurmountable problem manageable and know that we are not alone in the challenges that are coming our way and even find answers to some of the problems that we face. And once again, we have Ms. Diana Abruzzi, the charismatic founder and international chair of the International Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Her vision for women entrepreneurs to grow globally spurred her to start chapters in different parts of the globe. IWFCI chapters are now in Australia, Afghanistan, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Mongolia, Nigeria, Singapore, South Korea, Philippines, and Myanmar. Diana's perspective will give us insights into the new normal business environment which the world is heading for today. I invite Ms. Diana Abruzzi to now address the viewers. Thank you, Daphine. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Daphine, for inviting me once again. I've been asked today to speak on that topic, which will be what will be the normal or the new normal in this changing global business environment. So reflecting on this, I came to the conclusion that the anticipated new normal, which we are all anticipating, cannot take place unless certain conditions and things materialize. Because no one can really predict the future in a changing world. They can only observe the trends and contemplate the consequences, or in scientific language, observe the causes and effects. As we've watched the world reeling from the pandemic, causing appalling economic disasters across the globe, one can't help but ask the question, what is going to be the new normal? So where to now? 
Well, from Australia's perspective, and I'm sure many of yours as well, this will depend on new government policy settings. To get rid of useless red tape and bureaucracy, to free up enterprise, to find the confidence to dare to try again. It will depend on the ability of our out-of-date trade unions to share the pain of these changes and to fight the unemployment instead of just the employed. Because in Australia, while unions keep squeezing businesses to pay more and more higher wages and to also secure these jobs legally for life, no business will risk employing more people. The financial burdens in an unstable environment and regulatory legal risks are just too great. And most importantly, it will depend on the entrepreneurs who will be our business builders to see the next new wave coming and adjust to ride that risk to safe shores. You've got to remember, not everyone has the eye to see the next wave or the ability to adapt their style to navigate strategies to make the distance successfully. This is why entrepreneurs, the only true job creators, need to be honoured and revered more by our societies with juicier carrot incentives and zero consequential sticks for failing. The pandemic has triggered a new appetite for undertaking tough economic reforms. But the idea is to draw the right conclusions from our experience and how adaptable can we be to rise to the challenge. Right now in Australia, businesses and governments have made changes in days, which otherwise would have taken years. And we are in the consultation process now with more to come in the coming months. It is times like this that men and women become the most creative when their backs are to the wall. It's through adversity that new leaders of industry are born. New ideas are created where people begin to take charge of their own destinies and create their own unique lifestyles and not to be thrown about the whims of others. These will be the real game changers. And the nature of how we work is evolving with the impact of technology, with half of the jobs of the future I can't even begin to imagine. We already have highly skilled data scientists who have jobs that were never even thought of 10 years ago. None of us can predict, really predict the endearing jobs of the future. Therefore, we need to sign up for a lifetime of learning. We need to build our muscle from formal education to on-the-job training. Jobs are continually changing, so when the disruptors occur, businesses must be ready and individuals motivated to upskill to stay in the game. The soft skills around human communications are going to surface again as being very important and powerful. Where soft skills like empathy, intuition and self-awareness become the hard skills required to survive, especially in isolation or remote working conditions. With this move to this new distributed workforce with people working from home and not altogether in offices has also shown us that how and when we connect is becoming more important than ever. It's giving us more flexibility as to where we can live in relation to our work. In Victoria, Australia, where I live, we've seen a massive increase in people moving more and more to regional areas with excellent rail service and highways. And this is all within one hour travel time to the central business district of Melbourne and giving families a greater work -like lifestyle balance. But this is all going to create also a greater need for home-based offices with the potential for owners to either renovate or for builders to design the new biz homes, to incorporate dedicated office space with a private entrance, entrance if need be. You see, it's only for so long you can work from a dining room or a kitchen table. 
This was also called on councils to start providing dedicated areas where home-based businesses are able to rent small rooms or boardrooms for meetings. This will also create a new revival, and this is especially in Australia, revival of suburban and regional shopping strips with a burst of activity and a newfound relevance in providing the needs of home-based businesses in the areas. The coffee culture will increase. Well, people will have the need to meet regularly somewhere to brainstorm ideas and get out of the house. Like the old university days when we couldn't wait to meet and solve the world's problems at the campus cafeteria. In the past, Australia has always survived as a primary producer, whether it was the wool from our sheep being exported or the gold from our ground or the rich mineral deposits we dig up for the world. In either case, we have allowed other countries to add value to those products and then sell them back to us. There's nothing wrong with this, and we will continue to do it for everyone's mutual reward. But Australia also has a very competitive advantage in growing clean, green, healthy foods, and will double down on this in growing and manufacturing food for the world and the new related agri-tech jobs of the future that go with it. When we look at manufacturing, able to compete in the area of advanced manufacturing, this is not based on cheap manpower, but artificial intelligence. The skills to design, build, operate, deliver products and services to the consumer in the future will be high in advanced technology geared to human machine interface. Such as these things we are hearing more and more about, like 3D printing, advanced sensors, robotics, drone visualization, technology advanced analytics, quadrum computing, nanomechanics, and medical bioscience. But these positions will require higher intellectual skills, less physical skill, and more interesting working environments. As a result, the education system will need to be modified to allow access and development to all these skills, including the emotional intelligence skills, to balance and make sense of it all. So looking at it now, Unlike the Industrial Revolution, where it took decades to put into place, this cannot happen now. We need training systems put into place immediately, but it will mean disruptions and immediate dislocation of old ways and funds will have to be redirected. But there's no need for alarm. The new industries will create enough new jobs to accommodate all. Just as the Industrial Revolution eventually did, life always finds a way. So uh, in closing, I will leave you with this thought. It doesn't matter how wired up we are. It is still people who make and close the deal. That's the human touch. So a thank you and Godspeed everyone in our brave new world. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you, Diana. It's an honor to share this platform with women like Daphne Pillay and Diana Abruzzi. They are women who have the right balance of head and heart. They have a mission, a vision, and a sense of purpose, and their intellect strengthens them. I'm reminded of what Oprah Winfrey said, your personality should reflect your soul. And it's only when you yourself are empowered that you can empower other women. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Daphne, for leading the way. We all go through hard times, and right now, we are going through one of the most challenging times our world has ever faced. Fortunately, we're all in this together. This ordeal will not last forever. But in the meanwhile, we need to be ready for whatever lies ahead. We need to have a sense of purpose, a clear mind, we have to make clear choices, restart, reboot, and focus on the positive. 
Welcome, everybody. My name is Rupa Saldana. I'm a vice president of IWFCI India, your host for today on this current topic, the business environment, the new normal. The COVID-19 can best be described as a human tragedy that has impacted the global economy. But this global pandemic has had twin impacts on both lives and livelihoods. And as a reopening of economies continues across the globe, it's worth taking stock of the epidemiological situations and the trends that will define the months ahead. We have all got used to a masked world and the uncertainties that COVID-19 has brought. But it's time to ponder on what is, what stays, and what will be. And to shed light on this topic today, we have three dynamic personalities in the studio with us. The new normal as seen by, seen by them based on their accomplishments because they have the most relatable, practical and time sensitive approach in our changing, challenging times. Permit me to please introduce our panelists for today. We have with us from Malaysia, Dato Anusha Sansat Tiripasatam. Anusha is a legal eagle in Malaysia, the founder of the Buddhi Three. She's an accomplished lawyer and a pioneer in the field of corporate governance, governance and investor relations. She was conferred with the title Dato by the Malaysian government, an honor indeed. They say a woman of courage is a force to reckon with. And believe me, with her intellectual mind, she is an optimist and she sees a possibility in every situation and every crisis. We also have with us today, Hansi Mehr Rothra, who is the founder of the Money Hans. And believe me, she talks money. Hansi has been featured as a LinkedIn person profile 2018, and her ability to relate to anyone of any age, carder, intellectual level, makes her not just a financial wizard, wizard, but also the much sought after financial guru. Believe me when I say Hansi Mirotra is your compass, your map and GPS in the financial world. For her, it's all about money matters and financial intelligence. You need it especially in times like this. Our third speaker is a very dynamic man. And it is said that like fire is the test of gold, Adversity is a test of a strong man. Max Srinivasan is such a man who can withstand any storm or any challenge life throws at him. He took BNI India to exponential growth levels and today is the president and heads global markets of BNI and is based in Singapore. But what distinguishes Mac from others is in addition to his own accomplishments and success, he has the will, the desire, and the ability to make others succeed. Now, having introduced you to our three wonderful panelists, we have a host of questions for them. And as we start, Anusha, may I address the first one to you, please? Yes. So, Anusha, the question we have for you is this. How have you coped as a professional service provider and a business owner during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, um, you all know about Maslow's hierarchy, right? And I figured that I was right at the top now with self-actualization. And when the COVID pandemic hit, we all came back right down to ground zero, which is to look after our health and our security. So, you know, um, it just really is a reality check for all of us that um, we can't take our health for granted and that our safety and security is ultimately very important, uh, way ahead of every, every other priority. Um, having said that, I also remember what my mother-in-law used to tell all of us, and that is health is wealth. So when we look at how we want to grow our businesses and how we want to protect our assets and uh, all the sort of contracts and businesses that we have cultivated over the years, we now 
um, have a newfound uh, gratitude and appreciation for the state of our own health and, and that of everyone around us. Moving into actually the business and career, I think in this time of COVID, what I have discovered is that um, trust is implicit because, you know, in the time when you have to deal with people through virtual means, whether it's through teleconferencing or through phone calls or whatever you, you don't get to meet people face to face. Well, we meet like this online face to face, but it's not the same thing. So trust is key. And as a lawyer and as a corporate advisor, I believe that even for the business sector going into deals now, um, relationships that one has cultivated over time will make a difference. Most people are very concerned about not overstretching themselves and everyone is operating on survival mode. So when you are on survival mode, you will tend to want to work with or associate with those whom you have had a very long standing prior relationship. From a client perspective, I'm seeing a better chance of getting uh, income and um, sustainability of businesses based on um, existing clients. And it's, it is fair to say that in today's world, most of our business comes from repeat clients, from regular customers. So that is something that I'm seeing happening. And, and, I, I, and I see that trend across with other, many other sectors as well. Um, the new normal is really to be able to value uh, the human connection, to not ever take each other for granted, because when you're alone, and this loneliness of COVID, you actually really appreciate the ability to sit down face to face and have a cup of coffee and work a deal, right? Thank you for that, Anusha. Is it safest to say when the going gets tough, the tough get going? Yes. All our lives have changed in some way or the other. We're doing things we never did before in our homes and getting closer to family too. Above all, I think the message is clear. Credibility and authenticity is important in today's environment. Mm. Thank you, Anusha. Thank you. My next question is to Hansi Merotra. Hansi, could you tell us a little bit about the big idea behind the money hands? And what do you think is the time frame for the new normal in the businesses in India? Right, okay, well, um, hello everyone. Um, so my name is Hansi and my business is called The Money Hans. Uh, basically, after having spent about 20 odd years in the financial services industry, I realized that as much as money is important for pretty much everything we do, the financial services industry um, doesn't always have the right incentives to serve households. Um, so I kind of being an insider wanted to take that knowledge that I had and share it with the world. At this point, it's an initiative. So I basically make videos, write articles and so on and put it on a website and a YouTube channel. Uh, but the idea is that I want everyone, and especially women, who, when I, when I, when I go to um, social gatherings, um, people ask you, so what do you do? And I say, I work in finance. And they say, oh, you must be good with numbers. We don't have a head for numbers. Um, my husband over there is an investment banker. Can you speak to him? which I find amazing. Like how, why, why do you give your power away to the men in your life? So I want to make it, I understand if you can't, uh, can't do it because you don't have any money, but if you don't want to look after your own money, your financial independence, because you think it's too boring, that's the bit I want to fix. So all the videos that I've made um, are fun, are short, and they're based on not only finance, which I am an expert in, but also neuroscience, psychology, behavioral finance, um, anything that I can lay my hands on to make it interesting and fun to learn about money, which you absolutely need. And people say, oh, are you money minded? I mean, is that there's more to life? Surely you can you need to lead a happy life and and, and so on, to which I say it's money gives you options. I think that you do need to, uh, in fact, there, there was a study on what, what people who are dying at the end of their lives, what, what made them happy or what do they regret doing or not doing. And in the end, it was, well, I wish nobody said I wish I had worked more or got more money. Everybody said I wish I'd spent more time with family 
or I had experiences or I got to be who I really wanted to be rather than what family asked of me. So I think money gives you the options to do all of that. And at some point you kind of say, okay, that's enough and, and you can start giving it away. Uh, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, all the research on, on money, on happiness, on life, on relationships, all of that, I'm trying to bring together in one place and say, okay, here's what you need to know. And then you can go and lead your life, but build the foundation with being financially independent. Thank you, Hansi. I've watched a couple of your YouTube one minute Gyans and believe me, you're brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if it's Sorry, answering Cameron, the second question, um, do, uh, do you want me to address that later? The, the new normal? I'll, I'll yes, we'll come back to because we have yeah. a time constraint. Sure, We've got sure. to move to Mac now. Hmm? So it was Joseph Campbell who said, opportunities to find deeper powers within ourselves come when life seems the most challenging. At a time like this, Mac, we look to you. You've been a leader, a billion mile flyer, a business magnet. Don't, don't ask me what next. And the current situation has disrupted the business environment. BNI, of course, is the biggest referral network in the world. How has this affected leadership lessons that you've learned and how have you navigated through this? Oh, th thanks, Rupa, for inviting me on this panel. And for us at BNI, traditionally, we are the world's largest uh, referral uh, organization for small and medium scale entrepreneurs. And we have uh, traditionally for the last 35 plus years meeting in person, right? We meet at various, uh, every week at various hotels and uh, in different clubs or chapters, and we pass business references. And I, I remember traveling back from China the whole of last year, I traveled a lot. Uh, and I, I was in a, on a trip to China in the month of January. I just returned back on January 16th. And uh, when I, I got information that we have to you know, the hotels were closing, we cannot meet anymore. And a large organization like ours with over 270,000 global members in 70 countries, how do you move them? Or how do you, you know, even provide an environment for them to continue networking and doing business? So we, we had to come up with a game plan very rapidly. So one of the things that we had to do was how do we get us on an online platform? Yes, in hindsight today, everything seems to have worked well. And yes, we're having various other platforms we're using. We have already moved that. But if you imagine the days between January 16th and maybe February 16th, how do we even solve this? How are we even going to get this effective? But there's one thing we did. We didn't, we didn't stand like a deer in the headlights. A deer in the headlights is when, when a deer sees the headlights of a car, it just freezes. Most business owners in this particular situation, they freeze. But what we had to do is keep thinking of way, being innovative, figuring out ways, and we created an online model for the same chapters to work and pass money and, and make it effective. In fact, in the month of April, we, we were able to support our members where they were able to do over a billion dollars worth of business in the month of April, which was kind of unheard of. No small and medium scale entrepreneur has a, has a, has a community that's supporting each other. So that's what one is we, we were agile. We were willing to try new things. We were willing to make mistakes and correct them. So by the time March rolled around, we were able to roll it out across the 74 countries. Uh, of course, there were hiccups, but we were able to roll it down and around. And today uh, we are we are performing you know, equally well on, a, on an online platform. We had to get it branded, trademarked, everything, but that's working. Thank you, Mac. That was good. The world is changing and you're agile, obviously, and we're changing with the times ahead. Thank you for that, Mac. Valuable insight. Anusha, my next question is for you. Anusha? Yes, Rupa. Uh, do you foresee a lot of activities? Just a, just a second. Do you foresee a lot of activities in the cross-border merger acquisition space, considering some of the drop in valuations emerging out of the pandemic, that's the new normal. And what are some of the accompanying risks involved? Yeah, um, you can expect more, uh, a resurgence of, I would call it not more, a resurgence of mergers and acquisitions activity. But the difference in the new normal will be that it'll be a buyer's market rather than the seller's 
because it's the buyer that's in the driver's seat. As you know, a lot of companies' valuations have, have gone down really low. Um, and there are a lot of large corporations who are looking at divesting so that they can focus on what I would call as their jewels in their crown. Um, I think the impact, the impact will be seen in the next few months after we know um, how the travel restrictions will um uh, be lifted for different countries that is the biggest uncertainty because um, whilst we are all getting very familiar with, and comfortable with uh, teleconferencing with zoom with all the technology that's available but there are a lot of people who do business the old school way they still want to go and see the assets they still want to uh, meet people at the at the businesses that they're acquiring of course uh, i understand now from some of my business colleagues that uh, they're using even drones to go and look at sites uh, for acquisition purposes because they can't physically go there. They're doing that in the real estate industry. They're doing it for factories. Um, so we can see a lot of that. Um, there's, there's, it's going to be a, a cash, is, cash is queen. Since I'm a woman, I'll say not cash is king. It's a cash is queen market. So whoever has the cash and for the people who are cash trapped, it's all about negotiation. So one needs to be a skillful negotiator. And if you have got a, someone good to help you with your valuation, that's the key because the buyers will push for the lowest price. Thank you, Anusha. That was very insightful. And it's pretty obvious right now, I think, from what we've heard from all of you, that the need today is to update your business ecosystem to a more holistic approach, mm. to be financially sensible, prudent, and change with the changing times. I guess that's it. Now I go over to Mac again. Mac? Yes, Rupa. I'm Have here. you been interacting with many global business leaders across the world and been on panel discussions with government heads of departments? What is the pulse you get on policies that are powering growth? Yeah, Rupa, all I have been on several meetings now with uh, from chief ministers to the minister of uh, MSME ministers and all that. Most of the governments across the world are grappling with this situation. They never ever faced a situation like this. The only two large, uh, you know, a uh, situation like this that we have had in history is around 1918, 1919, when the Spanish flu uh, occurred across the world. And again, in 1929, when we had the Great Depression, where $100 was worth only $15. But this is what I call the black swan event. On one side, we not only have the uh, the health challenges that are where, where the pandemic, and the other side, the whole collapse of the financial markets and everything. So most of the governments now in various forms, there are three types. So, uh, some of them are they're working on three different levels at, for to support SMEs. There are certain programs and there are programs that support large businesses or even verticals like airlines and, and the food and beverage industry and, and the hospitality industry. There's a lot that they're, doing, they're grappling with. But the good news is the governments are being proactive. I've, I've been speaking to various ministers across multiple countries. I live in Singapore now, but in India and also from what I'm observing and hearing from my U.S. markets, at the local level, people are trying their best to support them, either in terms of giving, you know, some uh, some kind of uh, tax incentives or funds in some case, and in some case delaying their, uh, you know, loan payments. But there are going to be businesses that have to, you know, they cannot survive this particular uh, catastrophe, and they will have to think of new ways to come out of it. So, the, yes, the governments are being proactive in three different uh, um, verticals. One, they focused on verticals like airlines and bailing them out. They're focused on large businesses and what they need to do for that, and even for the small businesses, SMEs. Thanks, Max. I think it's pretty obvious that fiscal discipline is essential and good administration is vital in a crisis like this. Yeah. Thank you, Mac. Hansi, my next question is to you. Hansi, as Hi, a LinkedIn yeah. top global voice, for money and finance, what would your advice be for businesses and individuals to manage their finances in the next years in this COVID-related uncertainty? So I think there um, there is a framework with which to manage your money. And I don't think COVID changes that. 
um, in, in in the videos that that I've put up on my site. Um, I, I believe in dividing your money or your wealth up into three buckets, three to four buckets. One bucket is don't lose me my money bucket, which I call the essential foundation. So if you're building a house, that's the foundation. The second bucket is your long term wealth creation bucket where you invest money in public markets and you invest for the long term and you let it run for as long as you can, not touch it. And the third bucket is where you either run your own business or your hobby or whatever it is you want to do to actually really enjoy life. So they're the three buckets. Don't lose me my money bucket, market return bucket and fun bucket. And when you're ready to retire, you take bits from these three and you create a passive income to, to be able to retire. I think COVID does not change the fundamentals of how you build your overall wealth with these buckets. Um, so if you sort of try to move your portfolio to take advantage of something that is happening right now, you, you have to be much nimbler than sitting here and asking me that because the financial markets absorb that in sort of information in minutes and in days and weeks, uh, certainly not wait for months. Now, so therefore, what I'm saying is all of what you're seeing right now is already built in. In fact, you might argue that maybe the financial markets are running a little bit ahead. Um, and maybe they haven't seen the pain that will come post this, uh, which is why unless you have information that the financial markets don't, I would not recommend changing anything from the basic uh, building block approach to approaching your wealth. Makes Thank sense? you, Hansi. Yeah, it made a lot of sense. And I have watched your video in which you've done like an architect who designed the home and money financial planning. That was brilliant. Though it was a one minute one, it said a lot. We've also seen the accelerated shift from retail outlets to commerce. And there's a lot changing as we see. And Anusha, I have a question for you out here. Considering that the new normal may bring to play large dominant players in some sectors, how do you think minority interests can be protected? Um, from minority interests actually um are multiple um i'll take i'll take some of the scenarios um one of it would be the the people involved in the supply chain um whereas in before covid um we were all going full steam ahead with globalization you would have large corporations having uh different components manufactured in different countries where they can benefit from the cost and from the labor or uh, maybe even from the security perspective but with covid you have exactly examples um, where um, Samsung had to fly out electronical components from China to its factories in Vietnam. Um, Jaguar uh, Land Rover couldn't, couldn't function in the UK without having to actually uh, fly vital components uh, out. Um, to the UK from China when, when the COVID lockdown happened. So what I'm getting at here is that for the minorities, look at some of the opportunities when I for the local in suppliers because from globalization people are now starting to look back at localization so India for example you have a natural advantage you have got across so many sectors people who are SMEs I would look at COVID as a way in which you can reinvent yourself reposition yourself as an integral supplier of components, of uh, raw materials, of vital ingredients that perhaps an MNC may have looked to some other country that is now no longer viable or safe to do so. Um, there is always opportunity, even for the, I would call it the little man or the little woman who is who is an SME to benefit. And, and this is the time. So cult, coming back to relationships, cultivate the relationships, look at price point, look at positioning, look at innovating or re, uh, uh, reinventing how you package your products and services because um, everything is up for grabs now. Everyone is open to negotiation and uh, look at it positively. If you have got something unique, something original, something uh, that is affordable because again, like I said, cash is king, money is everything. So 
if you are if you you hit the right um, spots for for uh, procurement, uh, I think COVID uh, you can reinvent the rules of how you've been operating. Uh, even though you may be a minor minor business owner or minority shareholder in the company, I wouldn't really really worry about it. Even from a mergers and acquisitions point of view, minority shareholders may be worried um, about what it holds for them. But um, if you look at it positively, uh, study the deals, look at um, whether this is something that you want to associate yourself. If you're looking at it from a minority shareholders perspective, um, the it's at the end of the day, your choice. Yeah. Thank you, Anusha. Mac, my question is for you again. Yes, Rupa. Mac, okay. Yeah, As a global leader, we'd like you to share with us what are the main takes you, as a leader in this global crisis, the lessons and the tips you would give people who are heading businesses or corporates or whatever. We look to you for this, Mac. Yeah, thanks, Rupa. The, uh, I, one of the main things in this particular time frame is uh, the relationships. Just like Anusha said, it's time to reach out, reach back to your customers, people that are you are selling to now, people that you have sold in the past, and maybe five years back or six years back, you did great work for them, but you haven't been in touch with them. Now is the time to contact them back, not to ask for any business, but just to check on how they're doing. Building relationships is very key now because the, 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 the effort that you build, you put in now to continue building relationships with your clients, not only your clients, what about your employees? I, I see the frequency, um, there are two types of leaders. Uh, one is one of my mentors was saying there's a wartime leader and uh, a, you know, a, a, a leader that's in the proper when everything is going well. In a situation, a crisis situation or wartime like this is when leaders have to be in constant communication at all levels. They should be on a one-to-one -one communication or they have a group Zoom call or you know, uh, an environment like this. And they need to communicate much more frequently than what they did in the past. And they have to take quick decisions. We cannot have committees taking decisions anymore. And we have to be, like I said, agile. So one of the things that I'm uh, advising to my, to my team in BNI is have the uh, have daily meetings with your teams if you are doing it only once a week now have daily check-in calls because we are always on the online world now they need to be they need to be part of the game be very transparent let, and be more accessible whether on whatsapp or wechat you, you need to be more accessible now than ever before and one of the personal things that i do to keep our uh, is uh, we need to recharge our batteries as leaders we constantly keep giving you know we give 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 it to family to friends and so we need to find out the one or two things that recharge find out the one or two people that when you pick up the phone and talk to them you know you always come out happy right you don't need to dump your worries on them but find out are they maybe listen to music maybe listen to half an hour of any inspir inspiring music that you like and unless you recharge your batteries because we are always in, a, in an environment that's closed it's very important that we recharge our batteries only then we're able to give back to others. So those are the few things that I, I advise our entrepreneurs and uh, they're quite, they, they're starting to implement some of that. Thank you, Mac, for that. And as you mentioned, this virus could very well be called the black swan. But what's yeah. critical here is, as you mentioned again, technology, communication, and staying abreast with changing times. Thank you, Mac. My next question is for Hansi. Hansi? Yes. The question for you is, what are some of the trends you see in the personal finance and investment space? Do you see a liquidity crisis for investments? Okay, so since the last crisis we had, which is back in 2008, um, the world over regulators have been trying to um, make it friendlier for retail investors. In India, we've seen a bunch of regulations happen, which uh, try to reduce the incentives in the financial services industry and encourage retail investors to go direct. So, for example, in mutual funds, they've taken commissions out um, and launched the direct plans and, and so on. Uh, the world over also, the, the value of advice and the value of active mutual funds have been questioned. So the world over, people are being asked to take responsibility of their own investments. So... Uh, basically you need to take in charge be charge of your own pension investments and you need to make decisions on which funds or which investments to choose 
the issue I see with this trend, it's a great trend in one respect, but the issue I see is that we don't have the education or the research tools to be able to do that. Um, recently, in fact, last week, I saw something being advertised that you can now even uh, use technology to buy direct stocks in baskets that uh, are factor-based and thematic. All these jargon that are being thrown at you, uh, you are not able to understand. So my worry is that that we do end up getting sucked into getting pay, paying more fees and more commissions yet again. Um, Liquidity-wise, Yes, there is a liquidity crisis already in Indian credit markets, for example, and there was a, a series of Templeton, Franklin Templeton funds that got uh, are being wound up. Um, but that was actually a long time coming. So that there is a, a, a there was a broader sort of a need for reform that India hasn't done. So that this crisis has simply highlighted that problem. So coming back to what people, what investors could do in their own portfolio. Uh, my bits of advice are, please do not invest in things that you don't understand and ask a lot of questions. And if you are going to use an advisor or, um, or an expert, make sure your incentives are aligned and you get everything in writing. So I am almost saying I'm sitting on the investor side of the table rather than the finance industry side of the table and saying while there are new features and inventions Frankly, you cannot invent new asset classes. There's only two ways to invest, which is equity and debt. So don't fall for any of the innovations. And please hire some smart people to sit on your side of the table so they can advise you and teach you. More importantly, teach you so you understand. That's why I mentioned you are the voice, the compass, and the GPS for financial advice in hard times. Thank you, Hansi. Thank you. So my next question goes again to Mac. Mac, we have seen that Singapore has been able to control the epidemic, whether it's been with aggressive and targeted quarantine measures, the way the government has tested and treated, you know, in their uh, various hospitals, but the global pandemic has been contained out there. Has it had an impact on businesses in a major way? And what are the initiatives that we could that you all are using out there? I think uh, Singapore, they had a, they, they learned from the previous instance when they had SARS. So they were very proactive from day one. In fact, the, uh, the community spread in Singapore has been very much in control. It was one of the best controlled countries for, many, for a long time. The, the government did many initiatives like in the early days, making sure every household in Singapore got like three to four, you know, face masks, they made sure all the, the communications were done. People are, were quite disciplined. And uh, the of course, in the recent last two months, like eight weeks, there were certain uh, uh, dormitories where we have communities uh, the, of workers that have come in for construction. And that's where, because of the high density uh, population in those areas, you know, th that's where the maximum uh, of these cases are, and which is already being controlled. The beautiful thing that Singapore did is making sure that small and medium scale entrepreneurs have various schemes, either in terms of funding that goes to them, in terms of uh, discounts on rents, and they're doing everything possible to keep the small and medium scale entrepreneur and the regular community of businesses going. Now, having said that, every business is impacted. My, I'm very well connected among all our uh, BNI entrepreneurs here. We have over a thousand entrepreneurs in, in, the, in the community here, every one of them uh, is is affected, but but the government being able to support in in many ways and uh, giving uh, even things like they fund each individual uh, something for skills education like five hundred dollars is uh, wired to their account so they can go and upskill themselves. This is a time to upskill and recalibrate and maybe try out something else that so that they can when they come back to the environment like when when things get slightly normal they have something else to do in case their their primary purpose of business is no longer existent. Uh, so these are various things that have been done in Singapore. It's a, a kind of a role model type of uh, environment. But again, Singapore is a small uh, country. You have to imagine like when you, when you look at India, the scale of India is such huge. But I do uh, like the way uh, it was done in a very calm manner. There was no panicking. Every day there's an update given to us and there's a WhatsApp uh, channels and there's app, apps that were created for us to 
keep in sync and alert uh, others in case we have been in, in an environment where we were close to somebody with uh, with a COVID. So yes, there are uh, models that we can learn from Singapore. But when you're trying to look at a large country like an Australia or or even like in India, it, it is um, it's going to be a challenge for sure. Thank you, Max. No wonder they say the health of the people is the health of a nation. And Singapore has done very well, and you're in the right place at the right time. Thank you, Mac. My next question is, of course, to Hansi. You gave us a little insight on how to still be financially wise and not to panic in times like this. So, Hansi, I have a question for you. Can you please enumerate for our listeners a few potential sectors or industries which are attractive to invest in and to get a better return on their investment? which would show long-term and sustainable growth, something that you could share? Um, as I said before, I think it's, um, it's, it's very hard to pick an industry or a sector or a stock or a fund that already hasn't built in the uncertainty of, of what is coming. Um, a lot of time people sort of say, for example, the airline industry, um, they are getting bailouts, so are they a good investment? Um, you have to understand when, if the government could print money and give it to everyone and it not have repercussions, they would have done so. When, when the government prints money, they're taking on debt, which somebody has to repay. If it's not our generation, it will be our kids and grandkids. So I think when, when people sort of uh, look at uh, the short term impact on something, um, they don't realize where that money is coming from, what, uh, who has already taken the other side of the transaction, and how that's built in. So I, I personally would not recommend changing your investment uh, strategy at all because of COVID. I would say this, that if you were not living beyond, uh, within your means earlier, Hopefully this episode has taught you that you have to, you absolutely have to. When people, when financial planners would say have six to nine months worth of expenses in an emergency fund in a bank account and don't tell anyone about it or put it under the mattress, I don't think people took it seriously. I think now um, the, the, the very thing that we used to say as a first thing before you start investing anywhere else, that's where people are now listening to us. However, it might be too late. So I guess the issue is, the question is, uh, what do you do if you're already strapped for cash? And I don't have a really good answer for that. Um, what what Matt was saying, reskilling is definitely one that you need to be doing. Don't wait for a government handout. I think you need to, what I would invest in right now, seriously, would be my own skills. Because I can go to Coursera and edX. I've already done 50 courses. I actually, st I've started a business in the last two months, which I'm hoping to announce in the next couple of weeks. So I've I've tried to use this time, not just to reskill, but also try and uh, turn that into leverage and see if I can make um, a business out of it. But in terms of looking to, for other investments like stocks and funds and sectors, I would not pick anything um, that uh, doesn't require a second level of thinking. So nothing that I would, could say flippantly uh, without really analyzing. And nobody knows. I've listened to videos, podcasts, interviews with the best investors in the world, the richest, the most billionaires in the world. And trust me, when, when I say nobody has any idea, and they admit that, unlike previous times where they would glibly come on TV and say, oh, the market went down, this is what happened. The market went up, this is what happened. Even then, most experts wouldn't believe them. But now at least they have the humility to say, Actually, nobody knows. We don't know how we, what is the market? The market is basically other individuals. It's, it's collective human psychology. So what you're betting or picking is, will we behave like we used to before? Or will we behave differently? Will we spend more time at home and be, uh, be happy with minimalist or frugal living? Or will we go back to that big time living? All of these things, nobody knows. So any investment that you make requires you to judge how humans in different parts of the world will behave. And nobody knows. Um, so I'd say that don't fall for any um, glib advice on TV or anywhere else to say, okay, this will benefit and that will suffer. And therefore you should 
change your investment uh, like this. The only thing that you should do is make sure you have money in the bank or at home to last you a while. This because this will come and go. Okay, these these lockdowns will come and go. And I know people like calling it a black swan event, but the guy who invented the term black swan, Nasim Taleb, he himself gets very upset because he said we should have seen this coming. Bill Gates in his documentary last year saw it coming. So we shouldn't have been surprised. It's not a black swan. It was predictable and it will happen over and over again. If not this virus, it'll be another virus. So um, this is now a way of life going forward. So be prepared for it. Thank you, Hansi. I guess in addition to skills, we've all discovered hidden talents because we're spending more time at home and we realized with things we didn't do, hobbies we didn't explore. And when you spoke about money in the bank, I was reminded about the poem we learned in school about the ant and the cricket. Do you remember that, Hansi? No, because no, I that's don't very pertinent in this time. The ones who've been financially prudent in good times oh. know how to handle their finance even better in tough times. Yeah. Yeah. Am I right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Hansi. And congrats on your new venture, too. Thank you. Lovely hearing you. you. Let me announce it here. Yeah. Thank you. So I come back to Mac. Hi, Rupa. I remember that story, the ant and the uh, cricket. Hi, Mac. No, I said I remember A that story. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Remember it? Go Wasn't ahead. it the wise that? The wise ant and the cricket was dancing away in the good times. And the ant was busy being careful. Yes, but correct. not at a time like this, because you in BNI handle multiple sectors of business and you've seen so much. Is there a parting shot you'd like to give our viewers today? Sure, yeah. In, in times like this, it uh, impacts us in multiple ways. It impacts us physically, impacts us uh, economically and also psychologically. So uh, we, we, it's this type, these type of events we have never experienced. Uh, sometimes we have experienced an economic downturn, but, but having you know, a physical challenge, a, a economic challenge, and a psychological challenge, uh, we need to uh, learn to deal, deal with it, right? So this is the time where uh, uh, the, we have to take this challenge and convert it into something that's uh, going to come out much stronger. Uh, I liked uh, I liked it when Hansi said, you know, that she she actually is starting a new business or a new uh, entity. I know of several uh, business uh, uh, friends of mine in BNI who used to do events earlier, and then they moved on to uh, in this challenging times they moved on to like scanning systems, and now they're using their technology in scanning for events as a contact tracing app. So we have to be agile, learning how to move with the marketplace. And more importantly is, as unless we are health-wise good, that means we have to invest the time in getting back to the routines of exercise or doing something for, you, for yourself so that you as a person feel good. Because if you can either inspire yourself by reading books or listening to audio books or listening to music, plugging in with a few friends, uh, other things like you know going out and just walking uh, for a little bit if it's possible and that will actually have a huge impact on the days to come economically this too shall pass this particular challenge too shall pass five years from now we'll be much more wiser in handling the next uh, pandemic that comes along and Hansi is absolutely right you know many years ago Bill Gates had spoken in a TEDx uh, environment that this these type of pandemics are likely to come and that we were not well prepared enough Next time we will be well prepared enough, and the the psychological fallout of this is where I'm sometimes concerned about. Imagine the kids that are now when they're going to the park, they have to wear the face mask. It's not like when we used to go out and play cricket or do stuff uh, in the uh, in the young days. So that psychological impact may take a few years before it wears out. So it's back to you, uh, Rupa. Thank you, Mac. COVID-19, the pandemic, has undoubtedly caused us a medical challenge, an economical challenge, and also an ethical challenge. We see the true colors of leaders, governments, businesses, society, and this can be a game changer 
not just for businesses, but for individuals and families too. But as Max said, this too shall pass and we will be wiser, stronger, and things can only get better. India post COVID-19 could very well be the brightest spot amongst the emerging economies when it comes to FDI. Make in India could very well become a norm, provided we prepare the ground and grab the opportunity. India has its stage set, I'd say, to attract both the market seeking and resource seeking FDI. And tell me why? Because FDI will not just augment our capital formation, it's also going to act as a vehicle for technical upgradation, skill development, export promotion, job creation, improvement of overall competitiveness, competitiveness of the economy. And as they say, tough times last, they don't last at all, but tough people do. And I come to the words of a Japanese writer, Haruki Murakam, who said, and once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even remember if the storm was really there. But one thing is for sure, you won't be the same person that walked through that storm. And as we stop on that note, any questions that any of our panelists would like to bring up to one another, we're open to that too. Yeah, I just have one, one issue that I would like to share with the panel. You know, all of us have come to realize with the lockdowns and staying at home, um, that uh, all the businesses affected today are the ones with the biggest carbon footprint, right? Transportation, you know, oil and gas. And I, it makes me wonder, you know, in all this adversity, there are opportunities for those of us who have the lowest carbon footprint or firstly, the people who are sustainable. So I'm looking at growth opportunities and value creation for, for businesses that are environmentally friendly, that have got a very high social conscience and who are great in governance. What are your thoughts on that? Because if you even look at it from an investment point of view, I'm even seeing now exploratory interest from investors to look at taking over, we talked about mergers and acquisitions, taking over dirty businesses and turning them around and making them clean. So basically buy dirty and sell clean. I, I would like to ask the panel what your thoughts on that because um, that's where the game changer could be. Well, I'll I have just, some, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm <laughs> Diana, go, Diana, Diana, go, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying that um, that's what entrepreneurs do well. They can look at a company and others can't see it. But they can immediately see where they can turn it around and, and of course, the social conscience comes into it. And I have found with, uh, with some research that in America, the greatest growth of small businesses is a business that has a social conscience. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I believe also, Alicia, that you are spot on. That's exactly what we need. And the, but it's the entrepreneurial mind Yes. Who can look and see things that others can't see. And we've got to encourage them more. We really do. Um, I'll just add to that, uh, Diana. That's, that's very well said. Um, I've been following uh, ethical investments in Australia, which is where I used to work. And then that became SRI, then became ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance. And now it's become impact investing. So even in the investing world, uh, this has become a fad. But one thing that I've um, noticed in the last 25 years, yes, while um, businesses will do, uh, do this to, for, for their PR purposes, um, in the end, they listen to what their shareholders ask. But before they listen to shareholders, they will listen to what their clients, their consumers will ask. So I think this shift from traditional to impact or whatever we want to call it will happen only, only if as consumers we demand it. Yes. Okay, so if, 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 for example, I choose that I want to have, I don't know, free range eggs rather than cage eggs, or 
a, a, a environmentally friendly product rather than something else. It's only when I, as a consumer, make that choice with my money, that's when the business will listen to me. Until then, they are hoping if the shareholder, like these pension funds have started to do in Australia, super funds do this, where they invest in ESG and try to force corporates to change, but they are waiting for the regulators to step in and make that change, whether it's carbon tax or something else, right? The regulators listen to their voters. So waiting for regulators to change the law to, to unlock the valuation is a very long-winded way. You have to convince the voters, the citizens, then they go and change parliament, and then parliament makes the law, and then they go and tell corporates how to behave. Whereas there's a shortcut, which is be a conscious consumer. Look around. Everything you pick up, you buy. Ask how is it made. Stop buying latest fashion and throwing it out because textiles, for example, are the second worst polluters in the world after, I think, oil and gas. So stop buying latest fashion, for example. So you can't say you say one thing and then you do another thing. You can't do that. I'm sorry. You have to take an interest in how your goods and services are produced. Mm. Hamsi, can I ask you an actual question? Am I allowed to ask a question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Hamsi, um, when we look at technology and mm -hmm. um, how new businesses or businesses are going to bring in new technology, now we all know it's going to cost money. It's going to cost the dollars to bring in this new technology. Tell me, how does the financial areas look at helping in this area? without making it so difficult for people. <laughs> ah, okay. So I don't know that the finance industry makes it difficult. I think the finance industry has a vested interest, right? We, the finance industry is basically only built for connecting savers. So you earn money and you need it in retirement, right? You need to invest it until you retire when you can't work anymore. So you have some surplus cash. On the other hand, there are entrepreneurs with ideas. So whether it's a technology idea or biotech idea or a pharma idea, whatever it is, okay? So they have a two different um, stakeholders. The finance industry uh, does in fact connect the two, okay? So if your idea is no good or it doesn't, or you are not able to sell the idea to the finance industry, they won't take it, they won't invest in it, they won't take it to IPO, they won't uh, connect it, you to the savers. Because the finance industry, all they're doing is connecting savers and ideas. So when you say you make, uh, if the finance industry is making it difficult, they're not really, unless they're not doing their job properly, um, which is possible. It is possible that they say, oh, well, you know, um, that particular venture capital or private equity fund is done well and that back that idea. So let me all herd mentality go and back similar ideas rather than looking somewhere else for a new idea. But... I can tell you this, if you as a consumer start liking the idea, it's called traction, right? So if you, if an entrepreneur builds an idea, a prototype of a product, whether it's technology or anything else, and consumers start liking it, okay? Those metrics show up as traction, which is how many people are using it and liking it and telling their friends about it. The minute the traction happens, venture capitalists will line up to give you money, which by the way, is your money. Okay, you as a super fund member have invested, it's your money, okay? So they're only giving your, your, your members money back to the entrepreneurs, but they can't so, waste it, right? They right. can't waste it, they so, can't give it to any idea. Yeah, it actually comes back like every new business or any um, entrepreneurial idea, it still has to come from your own pocket till it takes traction and then the investors are interested. Perfect. And it's that getting ready to have the investor, that is the area of sometimes there's a problem. There are people that can help you with that. Mm. There are people help. There are um, networks, incubators, accelerators, lots of places that can help with getting ready for the idea. Mm. Anyway, I've got a question that's come up. Um, should I answer it? It's flashing here. I'd say, Anusha, go ahead and answer it. I think uh, Rupa seems to be frozen. Okay. So there's a question from Selena Joy that says, you spoke about the movement from global to local. 
What are some challenges that you foresee in this since the movement to global primarily happen to reduce costs of doing business? That's a great question, Selena. So on the one hand, we have all these big business who shifted, took the factories from high cost locations to what they what they appear to be low cost locations for, for that for that high profit motive. But now with the, the realization with COVID-19 pandemic, with all the issues that have happened worldwide, um, that's the whole rethink going on, right? Like I gave you the examples of Jaguar Land Rover and Samsung and everything. So here, the, here is the challenge for the local SMEs who have been the uh, part of that supply chain before uh, some of these large corporations took their factories elsewhere. It's again, to, to re to reestablish the relationship, to reposition your products, to renegotiate, but more importantly, is also for you to have innovated and improved on what your products or service offerings are. Um, differentiating, differentiating as opposed to what you did previously with what you have now. So um, a lot of it will also be um, your own country, your own people in your own country will realize that because of what is happening with COVID and because supply chains were disrupted, they will now look for local suppliers. So whilst you have the MNCs on the one hand who may be able to dictate all sorts of terms and conditions, but there will be a lot of local people who will be looking for local suppliers, for local producers. And this is where relationships, again, it's relationships is the key. Go to people that you already know, people that you've had prior relationship. If you've got a good track record with them, this is the time to reopen the conversations. Yeah. And um, also look at uh, consortiums because in this day and age when we are all struggling and suffering everyone has something to offer the other I was just ha having a dialogue with a few people in some of the countries that I have business dealings with you know what is the in thing now with a lot of professionals even like myself I'm a professional service provider people are bartering so, for example, if you've got, if you're an accountant and you're doing auditing services and I'm doing corporate advisory, so, okay, I've got $5,000 worth of services that I can provide you. You, you've got to do some auditing and finance for me and you're going to charge me that. So, they contra. So, in this day and age of COVID, people are actually looking at bartering when cash is Stop when cash left and stuck. That's another option of exchange. Rupa. Rupa. I don't know whether she can hear us. Okay. <laughs> She's gone. So, so okay, looks can, like, I, I think we just keep uh, asking yeah. each other some questions then. Yeah. <laughs> I think it looks like uh, we've, uh, Rupa has got some issues. She can't hear us. So maybe you can carry on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm done. Right. I'm done answering that particular question and throwing some more, some more uh, inputs into what's happening in the environment that I've been working in. So over to the rest of you in the group now to share. Mm, well, I think um, I, I honestly believe education um, has really got to be started to be looked at right now. Mm. And I, I think that every company now, well, in the globe, needs to think about how can I upgrade my skills? How can I get to know what's out there now? How can I set up my own manufacturing little company? All these things now they're going to be searching for. Mm. So education, they want answers. They want to know how. They want to upskill. They want to know about biotechnology. They want to know all about these things now. And I believe it should start in the schools because they are our future. And at the moment, I don't believe they're learning the things they need to learn to survive in this, well, I say the new world. And I, I believe they need to start this in schools right now. Mm. 
Let's not more like <laughs> <laughs> Okay, someone sent a question. Should I read it out? Yeah. Please um, go ahead. Kavi Malai from Singapore is asking, has this work from home trend created new opportunity for <coughs> women at home? Um, who wants to take it? Right, okay. Well, maybe because I represent the women, I suppose I should. <laughs> um, I, look, you just have to go back a little bit in history. Before the Industrial Revolution, um, everything was at home. They all had little businesses. Uh, they used to do the weaving there. They used to do all sorts of things. It was a real family event, and the children helped out. When the factory started in the Industrial Revolution, it actually destroyed families, absolutely destroyed families. And I believe with technology, it has brought women back to the home, and I'm not saying that in the wrong uh, context, they has brought them back to the family and enabling them to run businesses now from the home as they used to before the Industrial Revolution and where they now with technology are now trading the world. This has brought everything home to them and, and they're also able to have part more part of their children's lives. Um, there, there's a real opening there for women and really thriving in it. Now, someone did ask me at one of the APEC meetings in the Philippines, and they said, well, why doesn't, why aren't there more small businesses run by women? Why don't they grow? And I said, well, you think about it. I said, if you've got, say, two or three children, you know, just starting school and everything, I mean, do you really think you're going to grow this business to a point where you have no time for your family. I said it often happens when the children have left school with this business and all of a sudden it's now your time mm -hmm. and you take off like nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just my thoughts. Okay, another question uh, to Mac. How does the labor intensive industries would do Okay, how would labor intensive industries do, do business. business as labor uh, as there been labor migration? I I don't quite fully understand the uh, particular question. I uh, from so what I, I understand. I think what they're asking is what they if, if because labor has migrated, how would yes. the labor intensive industries restart, I guess. Correct. Yes, That's yes, probably because, what they're asking. I mean, it, it it goes back to like I I think I know exactly what he's asking like in in cities like in in some of the large cities like in India where people, uh, the labor had come in from various villages into New Delhi or to Mumbai. In fact, many of my members were telling me who are in the manufacturing, their labor has gone back or migrated back. And they may not actually come back to the city just because of the uh, trauma that they have gone through, like walking so many miles to get back home. And they don't want to come back. So labor, in uh, again, in, in industries that are so labor in, in, in with so, so much labor, they have to work out solutions. Uh, one of the uh, the, one of my members was telling me he's trying to get the the labor that was working for him to work from that same village. And he was telling me that the the cost of that person manufacturing, if the product can be manufactured in the village, the cost of that mailing may be even um, you know cost effective. You know they could make that product in that village and send it out, uh, send it back to that main city if they have products like that. It's where they can, so we have to be creative on what can be like offshore because that labor is not never going to come back to that main city for now. Okay. And if you really have the hands on, hands have to be in the factory, they they have to figure out a different cost model. It's not possible uh, for them to, uh, at the low cost model for them to be able to actually ramp up their whole factory that way. And uh, I have a comment on the previous uh, question too, if I can just share. I have staff. Uh, especially when women are working from home, there are two types that I have. Uh, I'm across the globe. We are a global operation, and so some of them love it. Uh, like in, in one of the businesses, they love working from home. It gives them the flexibility. But I have a certain segment of my 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 staff that's saying, "Hey Mac, when are you? When are we going to get back to the office?" You know, they like that compartmentalized time where they have some time where they're able to get back. You know, in a different environment. They, in fact, some of them are depressed um, because of the number of hours they're like in the same house. And when they're at home, there's so many demands. 
uh, you know, cooking, cleaning, kids. So it's a balance. It's it's working from home for women. It, it, it you'll have to see where exactly you are in that life cycle. Uh, you, you, some some women have kids. Some are single. Some have family. So I'm seeing a blend where some of them really want to get back and get a break at least during the daytime, and some of them really enjoying it. It's a balance. <laughs> That's what I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. Daphine, there's nobody actually um, looking after everything. Rupa? Rupa, are you back? No, it's back, yeah. OK, are there any more questions? I think, I think we'll conclude now. There's a question from Agita Menon for Hansi. Could you throw some more insights for the younger generation about right investments and from when? Oh, um, OK. So I, I kind of sound like a stuck record a little bit uh, in that um, this framework that I was saying earlier about um, foundation, pillars, uh, and the fund group. That's your three sort of thing. It applies to whether you are young or old. The only thing is that when you're young, you kind of discount something, which is your ability to earn an income. So when I'm young, say I'm 20 something, I have a good 40 year working life ahead of me. Um, I'm kind of that, not counting that as human capital, but that's human capital, right? And I have my parents to fall back on should something not work out. So that could be one way of thinking. And then you might say, OK, so I could take more risks when I'm early, when I'm young, right? Whether it's doing a career that, that I don't know, becoming an actor or a singer or whatever it is, or whether it's starting a business or, or whatever. Um, as you get older, you get more experience, um, but you replace your ability to earn an income with more experience. So that's the trade-off people have to make. So I think other than that, Young people don't have really anything else that is different. Same thing with women and men. Oh, sorry, one more thing I'd say is that uh, in, the, in the way I divide the money up from the, the, the essentials foundation and the pillars, the pillars have to let, they have to, you have to invest the money and let it run for a long time. So what young people have is time. The time to be able to put small amounts of money in today and let it sit there, multiply, compound, which is, con is considered an amazing uh, uh, a wonder of the world, which older people don't have. Um, but the trick is that you need to divide it, compartmentalize it so that you don't need that money. Uh, studies have shown, and you can do this in, in Excel in, in, at home, if you start in your 20s and invest, and you start in your 30s and you invest, just a 10 year difference will make a huge difference in the final um, lump sum money that you accumulate at the end of your working life. Mm -hmm. So my advice to young people is start young, start really young, start putting money away and put it into uh, index fund and exchange traded fund and into the market. So you start seeing, hopefully that answers a question. And we've lost everyone. So uh, it's just you and me, Daphne. Yeah, so we are going to conclude now. Yep. We are going to conclude. Never let a good crisis go to waste. This was said by Winston Churchill at the end of the Second World War. And if you look at history, many groundbreaking discoveries were made when people were in quarantine. Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravity while in quarantine, when Cambridge closed down its classes on account of the bubonic plague, and when he was in isolation. He also discovered the branch of mathematics, which is today called calculus. This fireside chat has offered wonderful insights into the world of business, financing, and networking in the new normal world. The speakers have found ways to show us on how to navigate through unfamiliar and uncharted territory. There have been rich lessons learned and lots of takeaways. I thank all the speakers for their time and inputs and to the viewers. We do appreciate your participation in this chat show. Thank you all. I now invite all of you for a screen roundup. 
So we say thank you and bye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.